All right, this is chapter nine of The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. My brothers came home with a message. Daddy's spending the night at the store. He also leaves instructions for us. Stay inside. A chain link fence surrounds our house. Seven puts the big lock on the gate, the one we use when we go out of town. I bring bricks inside. He doesn't know how to act, walking around in circles and jumping on the furniture. Mama doesn't say anything until he gets her good sofa in the living room. Hey, she snaps her fingers at him. Get your big behind off my furniture. You crazy? He whimpers and scurries over to me. The sun sets. We're in the middle of saying grace over pot roast and potatoes when the first gunshots ring out. We open our eyes. Sakani flinches. I'm used to gunshots, but these are louder, faster. One barely sounds off before another's right behind it. Machine guns, says Seven. More shots follow. Machine guns, says Seven. More shots follow. Take your dinner to the den, Mama says, getting up from the table, and sit on the floor. Bullets don't know where they're supposed to go. Seven gets up too. Ma, I can, Seven, den, she says. But Seven, she breaks his name down. I'm turning the lights off, baby, okay? Please go to the den. He gives in. All right, when daddy isn't home, Seven acts like he's the man of the house by default. Mama always has to break his name down to put him in his place. I grab my plate and mama's head and head for the den, the one room without exterior walls. Bricks is right behind me, but he always follows food. The hallway darkens as mama turns off the lights throughout the house. We have one of those old school big screen TVs in the den. It's daddy's prized possession. We crowd around it and Seven turns on the news, lighting up the den. There are at least a hundred people gathered on Magnolia Avenue. They chant for justice and hold signs, fists high in the air for black power. Mama comes in, talking on the phone. All right, Mrs. Pearl, as long as you're sure. You remember we got enough room over here for you. You just don't feel comfortable being alone. I'll check on you later. Mrs. Pearl is the elderly lady who lives by herself across the street. Mama checks on her all the time. She says Mrs. Pearl needs to know that somebody cares. Mama sits next to me. Sakani rests her head in her lap. Bricks mimics him and puts his head in my lap, licking my fingers. Are they mad because Khalil died, Sakani asks. Mama brushes her fingers through his high top fade. Yeah, baby, we all are. But they're really mad that Khalil was unarmed. Can't be a coincidence this is happening after Miss Ofra announced that at his funeral. The cops respond to the chants with tear gas that blankets the crowd in a white cloud. The news cuts to footage inside the crowd of people running and screaming. Damn, Seven says. Sakani buries his face in Mama's thigh. I feed bricks a piece of my pot roast. The clenching in my stomach won't let me eat. Sirens wail outside. The news shows three patrol cars that have been set ablaze by the police precinct, about a five minute drive away from us. A gas station near the freeway gets looted, and the owner, this Indian man, staggers around bloody, saying he didn't have anything to do with Khalil's death. A line of cops guard the Walmart on, e on the east side. My neighborhood is a war zone. Chris texts to see if I'm okay, and I immediately feel like shit for avoiding him, beyond saying him and everything else. I would apologize, but texting I'm sorry, combined with every emoji in the world, isn't the same as saying it face to face. I do let him know that I'm okay, though. Maya and Haley call, asking about the store, the house, my family, me. Neither of them mention the fried chicken drama. It's weird talking to them about Garden Heights. We never do. I'm always afraid of one of, one of them will call it the ghetto. I get it. Garden Heights is the ghetto, so it wouldn't be a lie, but it's like when I was nine and Seven and I got into one of our fights. He went for a low blow and called me Shorty McShort Short, a lame insult now when I think about it but it tore me up back then. I knew there was a possibility I was short. Everybody else was taller than I, and how could I call myself short if I wanted? And I could call myself short if I wanted. It became an uncomfortable truth when Seven said it. I can call Garden Heights the ghetto all I want. Nobody else can. Mama stays on her phone too, checking on some neighbors and getting calls from the others who are checking on us. Miss Jones down the street says that she and her four kids are holed up in the den like we are. Ms. Char Mr. Charles next door says that if the power goes out, we can use his generator. Uncle Carlos checks on us too. Nana takes the phone and tells Mama to bring us out here, out there. 
Like we're about to go through that shit to get out of it. Daddy calls and says the store is all right. It doesn't stop me from tensing up every time the news mentions a business that's been attacked. The news does more than give Khalil's name now. They show his picture too. They only call me the witness, sometimes the 16 year old black female witness. The female chief appears on screen and says that I was afraid he'd say, we have taken into consideration the evidence as well as the statement given by the witness. And as of now, we see no reason to arrest the officer. Mama and Seven glance at me. They don't say anything with Sakani right here. They don't have to. All of this is my fault. The riots, gunshots, tear gas, all of it are ultimately my fault. I forgot to tell the cops that Khalil got out with his hands up. I didn't mention that the officer pointed his gun at me. I didn't say something right, and now the cop's not getting arrested. But while the riots are my fault, the news basically makes it sound like it's Khalil's fault he died. There are multiple reports that a gun was found in the car, the anchor claims. There is also a suspicion that the victim was a drug dealer as well as a gang member. Officials have not confirmed if any of this is true. The gun stuff can't be true. When I asked Khalil if he had anything in the car, he said no. He also wouldn't say if he was a drug dealer or not. And he didn't even mention the gang banging stuff. Does it matter though? He didn't deserve to die. Sakani and Bricks start breathing deeply around the same time, fast asleep. That's not an option for me with the helicopters, the gunshots, the sirens. Mama and Seven stay up too. Around four in the morning when it's quieted down, daddy comes in bleary eyed and yawning. They didn't hit Marigold, he says, between bites of pot roast at the kitchen table. Looks like they're keeping it mostly on the east side, near where he was killed. For now, at least. For now, Mama repeats. Daddy runs his hand over his face. Yeah, I don't know what's going to stop them from coming this way. Shit, much as I understand it, I dread it if they do. We can't stay here, Maverick, she says, and her voice is shaky, like she's been holding something in this entire time and is just now letting it out. This won't get better. It'll get worse. Daddy reaches for his, her hand. She lets him take it, and he pulls her onto his lap. Daddy wraps his arms around her and kisses her back of her head. We'll be aight. He sends me and Seven to bed. Somehow I fall asleep. Natasha runs into the store again. Star, come on! Her braids have dirt in them, and her once fat cheeks are sunken. Blood soaks through her clothes. I step back. She runs up to me and grabs my hand. Hers feels icy like it did in her coffin. Come on, she tugs at me. Come on. She pulls me toward the door and my feet move against my will. Stop, I say. Natasha, stop. A hand extends through the door holding a Glock. Bang. I jolt awake. Seven bangs his fist against my door. He doesn't text normal and he doesn't wake people up normal either. We're leaving in 10. My heart beats against my chest, like it's trying to get out. You're fine, I remind myself. It's seven stupid butt. Leaving for what, I ask him. Basketball at the park. It's the last Saturday of the month, right? Isn't that what we always do? But the riots and stuff. Like Pop said, that stuff happened on the East. We're good over here. Plus the news says it's quiet this morning. What if somebody knows I'm the witness? What if they know that it's me, that it's my fault the cop hasn't been arrested? What if we come across some cops and they know who I am? It'll be all right, Seven says, like he read my mind. I promise. Now get your lazy butt up so I can kill you on the court. If it's possible to be a sweet asshole, that's Seven. I get out of bed and put on my basketball shorts. LeBron jersey and my 13s like Jordan Moore before he left the Bulls. I comb my hair into a ponytail. Seven waits for me at the front door, spinning the basketball between his hands. I snatch it from him, like you know what to do with it. We'll see about that. I holler to let mama and daddy know we'll be back later and leave. At first, Garden Heights look the same, but a couple of blocks away, at least five police cars speed up. Smoke lingers in the air, making everything look hazy. It stinks, too. We make it to Rose Park. Some king lords sit in a gray Escalade across the street, and a younger one's in the park merry-go-round. Long as we don't bother them, they won't bother us. Rose Park occupies a whole block and a tall chain link fence surrounds it. I'm not sure what it's protecting. The graffiti on the basketball court, the play, rusting playground equipment, the benches that way too many babies have been made on, 
or the liquor bottles, cigarette butts, and trash that litter the grass. We're right near the basketball courts, but the entrance to the park is on the other side of the block. I toss the ball to seven and climb the fence. I used to jump down from the top, but one fall and a sprained ankle stopped me from doing that again. When I get over the fence, Seven tosses the ball to me and climbs. Khalil, Natasha, and I used to take a shortcut through the park after school. We'd run up the slides, spin on the merry-go-round till we were dizzy and try to swing higher than one another. I try to forget all that as I check the ball to Seven. First to 30, 40, he says. Knowing damn well he'll be lucky if he gets 20 points. He can't play ball just like daddy can't play ball. As if to prove it, Seven dribbles using the palm of his hand. You're supposed to use your fingertips. Then this fool shoots for a three. The ball bounces off the rim, of course. I grab it and look at him. Weak? You knew that shit was going in. Whatever, play the damn game. Five minutes in, I have 10 points to his two, and I basically gave him those. I fake left, making a quick right and a smooth crossover and go for the three. That baby goes in nicely. This girl's got game. Seven makes a tee with his hands. He pants harder than I do, and I'm in the one who used to have asthma. Time out, water break. I wipe my forehead with my arm. The sun glares on the court already. How about we call it? Hell no, I got some game in me. I gotta get my angles right. Angles, this is ball seven, not selfies. Hey, yo, some boy calls. We turn around and my breath catches. Shit, there are two of them. They look 13, 14 years old and are wearing green Celtics jerseys. Garden disciples, no doubt. They cross the courts coming straight for us. The tallest one steps to seven. Hmm, you a kingin? I can't even take this fool seriously. His voice squeaks. Daddy says there's a trick to telling OGs from young G's besides their age. OGs don't start stuff, they finish it. Young G's always start stuff. Nah, I'm neutral, Seven says. Ain't Kenya daddy? The shorter one asks. Hell no, he's just messing with my mama. It don't even matter, the tall one flicks out of a pocket knife. Hand your shit over, sneakers, phones, everything. Rule of the garden. If it doesn't involve you, it doesn't have shit to do with you, period. The king lords in the Escalade see everything going down. Since we don't claim they're set, we don't exist. But the boy on the merry-go-round runs over and pushes the GDs back. He lifts up his shirt, flashing his piece. We got a problem? They back up. Yeah, we got a problem, the shorter one says. You sure? Last time I checked, Rose Park was king territory. He looks toward the Escalade. The king lords inside nod at us, a simple way of asking if things are cool. We nod back. All right, the tall GD says, we got you. The GDs leave the same way they came. The younger king lord slaps palms with sevens. You state, bra? He asks. Yeah, good looking va out, Vante. I can't lie. He's kind of cute. Hey, just because I don't have a just because I have a boyfriend doesn't mean I can't look. And as much as Chris drools over Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, and Amber Rose, I dare him to get mad at me for looking. On a side note, my boyfriend clearly has a type. This Vante guy is around my age, a little taller with a big Afro puff and faint signs of a mustache. He has some nice lips too, real plump and soft. I've looked at them too long. He licks them and smiles. I had to make sure you and little mama were okay. And that ruins it. Don't me call me by a nickname you, if you don't know me. Yeah, we're fine, I say. Them GDs helped you out anyway, he tells Seven. She was killing you out there. Man, shut up, Seven says. This is my sister, Star. Oh yeah, the guy says. You the one who works up in Big, Ma Big Mav's store, ain't you? Like I said, I get that all the time. The, I get that all the time. Yep, that's me. Star, this is Devante, Seven says. He's one of King's boys. Devante, so this is the dude Kenya fought over? Yeah, that's me. He looks at me over from head to toe and licks his lips again. You heard about me or something? All that lip licking, not cute. Yeah, I've heard about you. And you may want to get some chapstick if your lips are that dry since you're licking them so much. Damn, it's like that? What she means is, thanks for helping us out, Seven says, even though that is not what I meant. We appreciate it. It's all good. Them fools running around here because because the riot's happening on their side. It's too hot for them over there. What you doing in the park this early anyway, Seven asks. He shoves his hands in his pocket and shrugs. Post it up, you know how it go. He's a D-boy. Damn, Kenya really knows how to pick them. Anytime drug dealing gangbangers are your type, you've got some serious issues. Well, King is her daddy. 
I heard about your brother, Seven says. I'm sorry, man. Dalvin was a cool kid. 